But the main reason people are using our tools primarily, right, is, is they're just super fast. Our parser is about three times faster than SWCs and five times faster than biomes when run on a single thread. The transpiler is about three to four times faster. And the linter, like I said, is 50 to 100 times faster than ESLint. Hi everyone, my name is Don. I'm on the core team for the Oxidation Compiler and I'm the project manager of Oxlint, which is our linter. So what is OXC for those who haven't heard of it? OXC is a collection of JavaScript and TypeScript tools written in Rust. So we write tools to help you write tools. First and foremost, obviously, is we have a parser and an AST, which is production ready for anyone who wants to use it. It supports JavaScript, TypeScript, JSX, you know, the works. We even have support for some stage three proposals like decorators. We also have a module resolver, think require.resolve. It's API compatible with Webpack resolves, uh, sorry, Webpack's enhanced resolve. Uh, you can basically drop it in anywhere you're using enhanced resolve and just get a speed up. We also have a transpiler. So there's really two parts to this one tool. The first is a Babel-like transpiler for transpiling JavaScript and TypeScript, handle TypeScript to JavaScript and JSX. We're working currently on the different plugins that Babel has. We, in fact, just released version, uh, the alpha version for the transpiler. Uh, the benchmarks are pretty impressive. I'll show you those here in a second. But we also handle declaration file limit. So if you have a project that is using isolated declarations, uh, we can emit DTS files for you. By the way, I think Titian's talk on ID is coming up next, so I'm very excited for that, and I hope you guys are too. Um, we also have a linter. So depending on how many plugins you use, it's about 50 to 100 times faster than ESLint. We have over 400 rules natively supported with zero config, and 11 ESLint plugins, mainly the, mainly the ones that are very popular on NPM. Um, I think our, our coolest one, in my opinion, is the import plugin where we can we have um, no cycles and stuff like that. We also have a few custom rules that are not available in ESLint or in any plugins I've, I've seen. And some of the things that we're working on now that are still in the works is a minifier. We are taking techniques from Terser and Google's Clojure compiler and also a formatter. Basically, we're trying to be prettier compatible. It's not, that one's at about 40% completion. So who's using OXC? First is Rolldown. Rolldown is a Rust port of Rollup that is trying to be embedded into Vite. And they use every single one of our tools. If we have it, they are currently using it. Also, a bunch of uh, bundlers besides Rolldown are using our tools like RS Pack here, mostly the resolver for module resolution. Also Mako, if you've heard of it. The Nova.js engine. This is a, they're at about 40% completion for TC, I'm sorry, um, Test262. They use us, they use our parser to create their bytecode. And a bunch of other projects like Shopify, Preact, which is, made by one of the Shopify devs, and Affine, which is an open source notion, they use OXLint to just get faster linting. Why? What's the point? Why would you want to use our tools? Well, for starters, they're extremely reliable. Everything is tested until it's bulletproof. So we have a comprehensive test suite with Test262, all of TypeScript's test cases, and all of Babel's test cases for each one of our tools. The linter is heavily tested, and we benchmark every PR to make sure that there are no performance regressions at all. So in total, got about 95% coverage, but hey, you know, it's also, they're pretty easy to use. So you can kind of just stick in our linter right before you run ESLint. There's a plugin for ESLint where we'll disable the rules that we support, and you can kind of just run it for free. Now, if you want to use our parser, for example, or transformer in your own dev tooling projects, they're 
It's also very easy to use. So the AST is very well documented. It looks like ES tree for those who are familiar with that, with a few enhancements. Um, and you can just install it from NPM or Cresa IO. We have NAPI bindings, so you can just use it in your JavaScript project still. But also the API is like quite simple. So here's an example of generating DTS files using isolate declarations. I'm not going to go too much in depth into this. I just kind of want to go uh, do a brief overview. So each tool we have uses a builder pattern. You stick in some source code, some information. Is this JavaScript? Is it TypeScript? Maybe the output of another tool. And you can kind of chain these together in, what, 18 lines of code. You can generate DTS files. But the main reason people are using our tools primarily, right, is, is they're just super fast. So, you know, the benchmarks, these are all available on GitHub. You can run them yourself if you'd like to. We are, our parser is about three times faster than SWCs and five times faster than biomes when run on a single thread. The transpiler is about three to four times faster, depending on the machine. I think um, Motion re-ran these and got four times. And the linter, like I said, is 50 to 100 times faster than ESLint. You can just stick it in front of what your, your lint script and CI and just run it for free. And the resolver, last but not least, is about 28 times faster than Webpack's enhanced resolve. So I want to spend a little bit of time just talking about how we're able to do this. There's two main things. By using a native language like Rust, we are able to very, very carefully control how, when, where, and why we allocate memory. And also, we've designed this project from the ground up with performance as a primary design constraint, and we're kind of obsessed with it. Every single thing is nitpicked over from start to end, right? So one of the things we do is our lexer is completely handwritten. We do not use regular expressions at all, which are very expensive. We allocate almost no memory during parsing. We separate out the more expensive checks that would require allocations into a separate stage. So if all you want to do is parse source code, it just takes milliseconds. When we do allocate memory, we use a thing called a bump allocator. So imagine a contiguous part of memory, and every time you want to allocate a new object on the heap, you just move a pointer over. And that's now the top of your heap. So we can just do have O of one memory allocations instead of having to traverse a tree and then three objects and stuff like that. It also means that we get really good cache locality. If you allocate AST nodes as you parse, they're going to end up next to each other. So when you go over that AST, you visit each node, they were allocated near each other, they're in the same place in memory, you're going to get really, really excellent cache locality. For the linter specifically, we multi-thread. So if you have 10 cores on your fancy pantsy M1 Mac, uh, which this one I have, this one here, we use every single one of your cores. By the way, if you're interested in adding multi-threading to ESLint, you could earn yourself a cool 500 bucks. It's been open for a while. It seems feasible, but you know, if, if you're interested, you could earn some money. So these tools are cool. They're fast. All right. Why are we doing this? Who cares? So we're trying to power the third age of JavaScript. Now, let, me, let me explain what, I'm, what, I'm, I'm, what I mean. So I started writing JavaScript around the ES6 era. You know, TypeScript 2 was like a thing just then. That's when I really started getting into it. And I really love it. You know, the, the DX of writing JavaScript is excellent. The tooling is excellent. The syntax is flexible. You can have functional programming. You can have, you know, class-based, inheritance-based programming. It's fast enough. You know, V8 is an excellent piece of software. It works really well. You can write one piece of code once and share it on the server and on the client. You don't need to relearn a new language. It's, it's building software is like, a great time when you're writing TypeScript. But as the industry expanded, as our projects grew, we wanted new things, nice things. 
So maybe you want to use React. You want to use JSX. It's a really good developer experience, but now you have a transpilation step from JSX to JavaScript. Speaking of transpilation, what if you want to write the newest, greatest, you know, syntax features from ES Next, but you're trying to compile to some older browser? Well, you have to use Babel, browsers list, all that good stuff in order to do so. Um, maybe you want to ship less code for a faster page load. You use Terser to minify it. You use Webpack to bundle it. You use CSS modules. I know I use CSS modules. In order to get these nice things, you have to install all these tools, and all these tools written in JavaScript require us to have an extra step that takes a whole lot of time. Each single one of these things enhanced our lives. They made the developer experience better, but it, it ended up coming with a cost. Um, I'm sure many of, the, of you in this room are currently, you know, managing config file to config file to config file with some kind of chain together build system. I know I'm that kind of person. It's a full-time job. If you want TypeScript, you want CSS modules, you want SAS, you want it to be bundled correctly, you know, you want tree shaking, but you also want hot reloading, it, it, it becomes a mess. You, uh, one of my old jobs, uh, our builds took an hour. You know, T-Server took 16 gigabytes to run. I could run VS Code with T-Server and Spotify, and that was it. Um, Jess took an hour, 40 minutes, and ESLint was taking 25 to 30 minutes. And these are beefy machines. We had in-house beefy machines. So between, you know, not getting hot reloading and long build times and having to manage these configs, what if, God forbid, you upgrade Webpack and now your build's broken? It, it's, the, the experience really degraded once you ended up at this place. You know, we kind of lost the plot. I started writing JavaScript for the DX. It was a nice, simple language to write. And, but by adding, you know, after adding all these tools, which each individually made the experience better, it's now significantly worse. We're trying to solve this, right? We want a single, like we want a single tool chain to power the web. And OXC is building the bottom layer of this. We are building the primitives that you need in order to write the next generation of tools where it's not all super separate. You don't have to put them all together separately. They work well out of the box. And you, most importantly, you don't have to give up production builds and correctness and linting in order to get performance. You can have your cake and you can eat it too. And we get this by owning every single one of these base tools and writing it in a native language. Now, there is a good point here where, yes, there's a harder barrier to entry and it's not quite as flexible when you write something in Rust, you don't write it in JavaScript. But I agree with Evan Yu on this one. The base tools where the scale really matters, where it can have a really outsized impact, should be written in a native language. And then you can build your tooling on top of that through NAPI bindings and just continue to write your code in JS. And actually, just recently, I, I want to bring this one up too, we announced that we're part of Void Zero. So Void Zero is a company that is comprised of OXC, Rolldown, Vt, and Vitest, where we're trying to put all of these tools together and integrate them very tightly. So it's not just the primitives, which are each available in their own right, and you can use them in your own tooling, but we want to have a deeper integration from the, against the whole stack, right? The idea being... OXE powers roll down, which then powers VEAT, which then powers Vitest, obviously. So I hope that you guys are ex as excited as I am. We'd love your help if you want to contribute and help us build, you know, the next generation of dev tooling. Thank you very much. Thanks, Don. Okay. So that was a great talk. And there are a few questions in... The Discord. Thank you, everyone. How do you approach performance in the plugin systems? So we've been considering how we want to approach 
plugins. We want people to be able to write for, I'm going to talk about the linter here primarily. Um, we want people to be able to write their own plugins in JavaScript. We have a few ideas in play. I think one of the main ones is, as Chris was talking about earlier, some kind of, you know, WASM compatibility layer. We're also trying to figure out how, if we can just have those NAPI bindings be fast enough. It's still a bit of an open question. There's a few things on the table, um, but we are working towards it. Is it realistic to re-implement TSC type checking in Rust? No. <laughs> Do you want to elaborate? <laughs> yes. Um, this is, I mean, everyone's probably thinking about this, right? It, it would be excellent to have native speed TSC. TSC keeps moving and it moves very quickly um, at the speed of about $20 million a year. They have a full team and the ecosystem behind them and a gargantuan amount of code. For those of you who do not know, checker. the entire type checker is in a single file called checker.ts. It's 60,000 lines. It's so large that if you open it in GitHub, it won't preview it. It considers it a binary file. So not only is porting that code over a gargantuan task in its own, but since the target is always moving, you basically need to be able to keep up with several full-time Microsoft employees and community contributors. And people are talking about ways to have a compilation step from TypeScript to some kind of binary format. Um, I don't really know how that's going. People have tried to rewrite them, specifically uh, Donnie, who wrote STC, who made his STC project, uh, but he got you know burnt out. It's a lot of work. So that's a long way of saying no. <laughs> So I, unless I have $21 million. Oh, yes. Hey, I'd love $21 million and then we can talk. All right. So well, there you go. <laughs> Thank you so much, Don. <laughs> Thank you. 